All right, we'll go ahead and begin with opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in this Advent season. Um, and we pray that this uh, time of study of your word um, would strengthen this uh, faith and hope that we have in your son, Jesus Christ, especially as we read about this revelation of him. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, so I know it's been a little disjointed between me having COVID and then we had the uh, congregational meeting, but uh, we're going to start at Revelation chapter 3. And I'm trying to post all these videos up. Um, I need to do a video for chapter 2 because I didn't record when we went through that in the sanctuary. So I'm going to post a recap video, just record something on my own. Uh, Bruce, yeah. Uh, so uh, a couple of thoughts before we go to chapter 2. Sure, yeah. I thought that the uh, language uh, in beginning and uh, chapter 2, verse 8, and especially uh, 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich in, in the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So do not fear what you are about. To, so this is talking about the future. If I can get this thing to light up again, I hope here. Technology. Um, what you are about to suffer, um, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Okay, let's stop there. So I, I was reading some other commentaries. There's really nothing in, in our study Bible that, that makes any comment about this at all. Right. So I seem to remember this, having read this before, and I think I knew where I read it, I found it. So at any rate, uh, there are a lot of commentators that believe that this is actually referring to a period of time that would have been almost 200 years after John would have been dead to the uh, the 10 days that it talks about here, you will suffer for 10 days, is the 10 year persecution of Diocletian, uh, mm -hmm. who was the last uh, emperor before um, Constantine. Right. And Constantine allowed um, Christian worship again. Right. And there's, there are a lot of people who think this is actually a prophecy, a prophecy about Diocletian in okay. the 10 years of the worst persecution of the Christians in sure, the, yeah. history of the Roman Empire. Yeah. I think it makes sense. I yeah. Mean, to me, it just it clicks. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't dispute that necessarily at all. Because um, that, that is that was a very tense time for Christians, certainly. But it, but it was after he was dead and long gone. Yeah. So this uh, to me, this is just as uh, much evidence yeah. that it's, it's it's true, right? Because some of these prophecies they've already come true. They've already come true, right? Well, in like the temple in Jerusalem, it would right. be a great example, right? What validates yeah. our, yeah. our belief in the yeah. Old Testament validates we can, what Christ said, because we know that so much of what was predicted there has already has already happened. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's like okay, the proof's in the pudding here. Yeah. The other thing, I don't know whether we talked about this or not. But I was counting the seven candles. Okay, in the yeah. Sanctuary. Yeah. And I was thinking, bingo. So why a letter to only seven churches when there were certainly more? Than right. That? Yep. Well, I think it has to do with full, complete. Yep. That seven, that seven being the seven things that we should be looking at. Yeah. Yeah, there's sort of that balance between this. these were historically true churches, as you've even mentioned with the idea that this historically was fulfilled, but there's also certainly a symbolic, and there, it's not either or, it can be both of these things. Um, so I think you're absolutely right, especially as we see all the various um, aspects of what he either critiques or encourages them with or promises to them. I think it's very symbolic of, of the promises to the whole church. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for sharing all of that. Yeah. So that was to the church in Smyrna specifically. I mean, not to say it was limited only to Smyrna in terms of that persecution. Um, so we've gone through, what, uh, five of the church, or we're on church number five out of seven when we start chapter three. So let's just go ahead and start there. And again, we want to look at what are the specific critiques um, our Lord gives to this church, but especially what are the promises that he gives to them? That's that's where it's really enjoyable, I think. Um, Dean, can I have you start reading for us? If you would do chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, 6, please. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. I know your works. 
You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you, yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before the Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. So what do you think of this? It mentions the reputation. You have a reputation for being alive. Yeah. What, do, what all do you think that might be sort of referring to? Because sometimes I think about you know, the term nominal Christian. Okay, yeah. Yep. In name only. In name only, sure. Which is, which is a sad, sad thing. Yeah. I, I think there's that. Um, and, and you think, especially like in our context, and, and certainly we're departing from this, but you know, uh, for a lot of American history, it was just almost assumed people were Christian. And so you could just kind of loosely, right. loosely say you were Christian, have a membership at a church, but it may not really mean a darn thing to you. Um, but I also wonder if it's not more than that. I wonder, um, you know, on the one hand, what do we look for to, to judge others? And maybe judge is not the right word, but... Um, we look for outward signs of faith. And that's really all we can go off of. You know, what people say and what they do, we can really only put the best intentions on people. But we know truly it's the heart, right? It's not if you do outward things, then you're, no. It's, it's truly in the heart. So um, there's this idea of what we call the visible and invisible church. And by that, I mean, you could, you could say our sanctuary when it's full, you could say that's a visible church. You see people doing Christian worship. And so you just kind of assume everyone there is a Christian. But there is this idea that perhaps there are people there that are maybe just going through the motions. They're there for just, you know, they, that's what they've always done, but they've never really believed it. You know, they're there. Whatever other reason might have them there. It could be purely outward. And likewise, you could have someone that you, you look at them and from your perspective, you'd say, I don't have any reason to think they're a Christian. They don't display it anyway. And, and likewise, you know, maybe based off that, we would not have a lot of hope for them, but truly they might have a genuine faith. Or I like to think of, um, you know, when we talk about different denominations, there are those that start to skew further and further away from what can be called Christian. But, you know, I think even of like Mormons. You know, we clearly confess that is not a Christian church in a sense that they have Christian doctrine. But could there be faithful Christians that are members of a Mormon church? And the answer could be yes. I wouldn't bet on it necessarily not for any given person. But, you know, again, they could be a, a, a nominal Mormon, but actually have a faith in our Lord Jesus. So um, there's something there with that, uh, that, you know, you know, we can do things outwardly to give people an indication we're Christian. And in a sense, when we uh, look at others, we can really go only go off of that. Um, I'm not sure what the case is here necessarily. You know, if it's a malicious uh, faking of being a Christian, uh, you know, there's a, I think there's a number of different things that could be. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you made me think of Isaiah 66. This is. Isaiah speaking to the nation of Israel. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Yeah. Says, Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, Let the Lord be glorified, just lip service. Yes, to God, right, yeah. That we may see your joy. Yeah. But it is they who shall be put to shame. Yeah. And so even in the congregation of Israel, it's clear that there were, you know, you can say the visible nation of Israel. Oh, that's textbook right there, right? There's, yeah. yeah. There's a portion, a remnant, yeah. if you will, yeah. and the scripture talks about a remnant <laughs> of true believers, yeah. and those that are in name only, if you will. Yeah, and, and I think there's something to that, that uh, we should be um, very skeptical when you have a whole nation that's Christian. 
Because you're inviting people to have just an outward form of Christianity and not actually have an inward faith. So the kingdom of Israel is there. Oh yeah, we're God's chosen people. We're sons of Abraham. Of course we're believers. Well, no you're not. It's just, you, you have the outward form, but you're also unabashedly going over and uh, joining with the ashram pole and, and Baal worship and whatnot. So... Um, yeah, that, that is the sad truth is we, you know, in a sense, we don't know. Not that we need to be worry about people necessarily. We just go off of what fruits of faith we see. Um, and we don't need to worry or doubt about people. But there is something to that. There are sheeps and wolf clo- or wolf, wolves and sheep clothing, rather. Maybe the other way around, too, perhaps. And, uh, um, but so our Lord cuts right through this, though, and, and calls us to be genuine in our heart. Um, but, as you mentioned with the remnant, there's clearly a remnant here. Not all of them are, are just outward Christian or just outward Christians, but truly there are those who have not soiled their garments, he says. Yeah, and Pastor, it, it's so encouraging because people who are in that group that are perhaps just nominal Christians yes. don't have to stay that way. Yeah. Pastor Leonard, uh, Pastor Newman, yeah, yeah. had shared something that happened to him uh, in his congregation, um, they had a, a one of the Gideons come in yeah. to his congregation, and when he left after the service, he said, "I've never heard the message of the gospel presented in that way." Um, and he shared that yeah. he had been a Gideon for years, and even was thinking about leaving the Gideons. And yeah. You know, I think he really came to know the Lord. Right. Even, you know, after all the exposure that he had to mm-hmm. Christianity and yeah. the truth, uh, it's it's wonderful that I mean, people, God can wake them up right right in the middle of a sermon. Yeah. You know, what's the maturing? Yeah. Process. Yeah. You know, we started out as baby Christians. Right. And grow and, you know, sometimes you get sidetracked maybe a little bit. Well, and we we might take it for granted, you know, and I think we should be, you know, rightfully proud in our denomination. I and mean, we really emphasize, we preach Christ crucified. And sometimes it's going to be like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, we can talk about a few other things. And that's true. But why do we say that? Because it is so easy for Christianity to be, to be portrayed in a way that is not centered around Christ and Him crucified. And if it's not... It's going to be nominal faith, or it's going to build nominal faith, or even if the preacher, they know better, but they're focusing on, they want to talk about application or how to be a better Christian, and the people are never hearing it, that's how that happens, which is just, I'm sure, I'd be curious to talk to him, but I'm sure, I'd be curious what uh, Bess Newman thought, you know, if he thought his sermon was profound or just very normal, or if he hated it that day, but yet it happened to be all it took to just, to just simply display it. So, absolutely. Um, so, uh, again, you know, we don't have to be skeptical of everyone, but we can also say, boy, you know, uh, it's not enough just to go through certain motions or just say certain things. Um, so. It seems to be something that God has cared about from the very beginning is the actual state of your heart. Oh, yeah. As opposed to, I mean, like the first. Yeah. In Genesis, mm-hmm. when Cain killed Abel, it was because his heart wasn't the right place. Right. right? He went through motions of giving, but he didn't love God above himself, right? And so, at the beginning of the Bible, it's all tied together yep. about how our hearts come to him. Yeah, and it's this balance of, on the one hand, faith moves us to do certain things, and so that's why the book of um, you know Hebrews talks about Abraham was justified by how he acted based on faith. He did outward things. He couldn't have just said he had faith and then acted differently. No, that would be proof that he's not a Christian. Um, but at the end of the day, it was the heart that moved him to do these things. So by faith, you know, Hebrews mentions all those people. Uh, and what does God say? You know, does he want these sacrifices? Well, no, he doesn't really actually want these sacrifices. He wants a heart that um, returns to him. The offertory. Yeah, yeah. Psalm 51, create me a clean heart. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, but it's the Holy Spirit. God pouring out his Holy Spirit. It is, right? Two people can hear the same thing. We, we don't know where the spirit goes, the wind. One right. And not the other. Right. Um, I think more of what it is is, you know, the spirit can enter our heart, but, you know, what we do based on that does matter. You know, you don't say, well, it's the Holy Spirit's work, so 
if it moves me to go to church, I guess it does. If it doesn't, no. Uh, so, um, yeah, certainly our actions uh, matter. Um, yeah, well, so again, what is the comfort here? Despite the fact that this is apparently a hypocritical church in the sense of they claim faith or rely on a reputation and that they are asleep, nevertheless, there are the people, a few names, who have not soiled their garment. They will walk with me in white. They are worthy because of their faith. And that's what he says, to the one who conquers, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And so that's a comfort for when we feel like we need to be faithful, but we realize those around us are not faithful, or, or whatever the case might be. Um, again, that's, you know, on the one hand, you want a Christian nation. On the other hand, it's a great way, you know, this is what we're wrestling with with schools even. Um, so when you have a Christian nation, it's easy as parents to rely on, you know, the state or the school or the whatnot to do education, whereas for us it really should always be at the home. And then all it takes is for it to be the nation of Israel. Well, we're the nation of Israel, but the, what are they teaching the people to do? To go after Baal. Uh, so for us, you know, thanks be to God if we have Christian rulers um, that have, you know, promote Christian laws and ethics. But on, at the same time, we do not want to ever rely on the state uh, to be uh, what enforces Christianity. We want it to be grassroots always, you know, by the Holy Spirit. Something I noticed when I first moved here, mm -hmm. when um, I go on bus trips, mm -hmm. in California, it was just chitter-chatter. But here, people would say, hi, I'm Diane, what church do you go to? They <laughs> made the assumption that everybody yeah, there's, here goes to church. And that's kind of, that's, that's kind of deteriorating, but, you know, certainly, you know, you think of the Midwest especially, you know, yeah. you, you just had a culture church, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that was good, but also it kind of led to people just relying on those assumptions or just, and then, yeah, and what happens is, you know, it happens with the children. The parents are good with it. And then what do the children deal with? They deal with a more, um, with a nation that's departing for their way, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then they're suddenly wrestling with this. Well, I know I was taught to believe this, but I look at what's going on and I don't know if I agree with what the church says. And they were never necessarily taught well because it was just assumed they'll be a Christian. We can rely on the system. Whereas, no, again, for us, you know, it always needs to be grassroots. And so, and that's why when, honestly, when Christians are under persecution, that's, it distills down to, you know, its truest form. You have the people that are willing to be the remnant, even when it puts them at odds. So, um, yeah. But the white garments, you think of the baptismal language, certainly being called children of God, being clothed in Christ's righteousness. Well, let's move on. Um, Mike Ford, do you want to, can I have you read? Sure. If you'll do the Church of Philadelphia, so 7 through, um, what, 13, I think, there. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? Yes. The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open, and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of, your, of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but they lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. <coughs> because you have kept my word about patient, and patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try, to, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Very good. Um, 
The opening line, I really enjoy. Um, we'll sing the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, oh, yeah. the fourth, the last Sunday of Advent. And that's based off of these old um, antiphons that they would sing the days before uh, Christmas. And it's these different titles for Jesus, Emmanuel. Um, one of those will be um, O Come, O Key of David, and it quotes this here. <laughs> The key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Um, and this is sort of a similar language that we see Jesus use a couple different times. Um, this certainly sounds like what we call the office of the keys. Jesus grant, granting the keys of forgiveness to his church because the keys of forgiveness are effectively the key of Hades, of death, of condemnation. And so what does he say? What does he tell his disciples? He breathes on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness, it is withheld. Now that wasn't about them making these judgments and they get to decide who's forgiven or not. No, but they have the, the power to proclaim the forgiveness in Christ's name. So that when repentant sinners come up, guilty and horror-stricken, they can pronounce, you are forgiven in the name of Christ. Um, you have been set free. Um, even the, the Greek word that's often used for forgiving of sins is called is um, it, it's a word for loosing the loosening of sin. Um, the idea that you're unbound by your sin that's what forgiveness is the unlocking. But likewise, what do we also what did he also tell them? If they are not repentant, you withhold forgiveness and you make a point of saying no. This is you are locked out of this because of your unrepentance. Um, very much what we see about the last day in general, too. So who is Christ but the key to eternal life for us? And he grants it to us in the church um, through, through the forgiveness of, of his sacrifice. Dave, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've heard this and I've done this oftentimes in prayer, mm. praying verses back to the Lord. Yes. And, you know, I, I know... In times uh, when I was unemployed and looking for work, mm. I would ask the Lord, well, I've got these possibilities. Father, shut the door on those things oh, that are out of you sure. and yeah. open the door yeah. that no one can shut. Yeah. And anyway, I've, I've used that just in prayer before. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but he sort of builds off that. In verse 8, he says, I know your works. And he says, Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. Now, when you think of that language, what, what all do you think of? Think about other scripture passages. Just blurt them out. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah, so that, that would be one. Absolutely. What else? So one of his I am statements, right? I am the door. And um, we might, might also think of I am the way. Um... I would also think about, uh, you know, the way is narrow. So there is a door. There is a, an open door. Um, death cannot shut us out from it. Um, like the eye of the needle? Yeah, and, and that even comes in too as well. It is impossible for man to go through this door on his own. But with God, all things are possible. So... Um, there is this beauty. What does he tell? I have opened the door for you. It is wide open. I have done everything. You do not have to do a thing to enter through this. But what does he tell them? That they, that they need to, uh, you know, be patient and endure. What does he mention? He mentions the crown. Uh, where was that? Um, Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. And I think that's kind of to what the point that, um, that Cindy, that you brought up about, well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Well, but he does also tell us that we have work to do. Yeah. And we're not justifying ourselves. We're not earning our salvation, but we need to hold on to our faith. Well, we either accept or reject the right. Holy Spirit. Right. Well, and we do that, but then it, there is this ongoing process, right? We make decisions that um, can harm our faith. Yeah. You know, that's back to the offertory. You know, it's David. You know, he's faithful. He's great. He's trusted God. He killed Goliath. He did all these great things through faith. But then also what happens? Temptation comes. And the implication there, uh, there are people that will argue that the Holy Spirit departed from David at that time. And that, that kind of makes people uncomfortable because you think, gosh, every time I sin, does the Holy Spirit depart? Well, let's not get caught up in that. What should we do regardless? Repent. Create in me a new heart. You know, we shouldn't ever rely and say, well, I've got the Holy Spirit. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to sin anyway. No, that, that's, that is totally unbelief right there. 
Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but, uh, yeah, we are taught to hold fast to this. Um, absolutely. And in that way, it's just it's, it's about hope and endurance. It's not like we have to do some great thing. Not that it's easy to endure. No, it's hard. But we don't have to do some extravagant thing. We just need a basic trust in our Father in Heaven. As um, David said, we should pray scripture. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Yeah. You know, God, yeah. Please keep us. Well, why, and why do we, why is that so good what they've brought up? It's yeah. reminders. Again, we don't just read all this once and say, yep, I agree with all this. This is what I believe. Because, no, your head is filled with everything but this. So that's why we go right back to the scriptures. That's why it's never, you, don't, you can't read scripture too much in that sense. You know, that's, that's the beauty of our liturgy, that we repeat these things, that we remind ourselves. And yes, we can go through the motions. Well, guess what? There's always a way to do something sinful. There's always a way to do something ungenuine. Um, but I think that's what's beautiful about um, our liturgy, that we're repeating these things, reminding ourselves of these promises we have. And the singing of the scripture. Really well, and it does. There's sort of a, there's a gift of the music in that, but you know, ultimately what does music do? It moves us, right? I was thinking about that the other day. Um, I, I think I mentioned it before, but the movie Coda, did anyone, has anyone seen that? The, the deaf family? There's a, they have a daughter that's hearing, but then the parents are deaf and the sibling is deaf. But she gets big into music. And, you know, you're thinking, well, yeah, that's a bit awkward because they have no way to appreciate And so they don't care that she's doing music. And, of course, in a sense, they don't care. But th- finally, they go see her perform. And, of co- and, and then it cuts to, like, their perspective. So it's silent. But they look around and they can see everyone kind of moving and bobbing and, and they can see the joy. And so then by the end of it, though they can't hear the music, that you, you can tell they have the sense of joy that music is giving everyone else. Well, that's that's the point of, you know, why, you know, that's what's, uh, we had a visitor last week and he asked me, well, do pastors have to sing everything? What if a pastor can't sing? And I said, yeah. well, that's fine. You don't have to sing. But it, it's just, yeah. it adds something. And ideally it should be. Uh, to add, you know, a, a sense of, uh, to help cut through our stony hearts, um, you know, beauty does that. So, Even though they can't hear the, the sound, they can feel the Well, they feel, yeah, they feel things, yeah. They feel the vibration. <laughs> well, and throughout the movie, they kind of show, I, I love it, but they kind of show the peace. You know, they, they don't care about all these outside noises. There's a part where the girl's trying to do homework and, like, her mom comes up and, like, slaps the dishes on the table really loud. And they're doing all these things that are really loud because they don't hear it. And it doesn't bother them. And I remember thinking, as much as I love music, gosh, to have peace and silence, you could just close your eyes and not notice anything. I mean, there's something to that. Uh, That's a good reason to memorize yeah. Yeah. scripture. Yeah. Unfortunately, you, I was confirmed as an adult. Yeah. We didn't have to do yeah. any memory work. Yeah. But I think the kids, they didn't value that they were memorizing all this. Well, and that's just it, right? I mean, that's the beauty of, of memorization is you, you teach kids to memorize it. They don't know what it means. They just memorize it. But then as they're older, they already they know that they, yes. these words are in me. I don't, And I just now realize what they mean. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a beauty to repeating things. It's comfort. It's hope. Um, I, hear, I heard a story from a pastor, um, and he said he had a, a girl in his congregation, I, I think a 20-year-old or so, telling him that, she was just struggling with her faith and she didn't and and he actually told her like just keep like recite the creed recite the creed and she's like what do you mean recite the creed he said just keep saying it mm-hmm. and his point was the more you take this in it shapes you and even if it's not going to make you believe it's not like if you just repeat things it's not like the pharisees with their long prayers were doing some great thing but when we digest the scripture in that way you, i mean you are what you eat you are what you consume right um, a statement of faith well, and it is, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it shouldn't be, obviously, we have it memorized, and it's easy just to say it and not think a thing throughout it. But uh, it is rich and full, so. And I can't sleep. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dave. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, I, I read the book, I think it was the <coughs> biography of William Dawson Trotman. He was the... Uh, founder of the Navigators, which was a, a, an on-campus oh, organization, sure. yeah. and they focused much Excuse on me. Bible memorization, yeah. scripture memorization. Yeah. And, um, in his own personal life, you know, his parents trained him up 
very well. <coughs> yeah. He learned a lot of scripture. Right. But he knew he didn't know the Lord. Yeah. And he he was, you know, walking down the street one day and the Lord brought one of the verses that he had memorized to heart. Yeah. To mind. Yeah. And he came to faith. Right. And so scripture is so important because yeah. we can't be born again without the scriptures. Yeah. We can't grow in the grace and right. knowledge of our Lord Jesus right. without the scriptures. So yeah. anyway, that, that was just a neat uh, account that he gave in his biography. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and keep going if there's not any other questions. Uh, on the wrong page. So what, now we're at the church of Laodicea. Um, Bruce, can I have you read? 14 through just the end of the chapter. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy uh, from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich and white garments, uh, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve your... Uh, uh, and sound to ointment, anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and uh, discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he will and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, all, uh, as I also conquered and sit down by my holy Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We don't think about that throne bit. You never hear about that. that. We'll sit on a throne with him. That's, I mean, that's just wonderful. And again, that we should almost be taken aback. Like, really? Is he saying that? Aren't we supposed to be around the throne? You know. But there, there's this beauty to, again as as being fellow children of God. We are also heirs, and therefore, you know, part of the royal family in heaven. You could think. Oh, absolutely beautiful. And back to the, you know, the title he gives. The Church of Laodicea write the words of the Amen. Isn't that great? He calls himself the Amen. Truly, truly, you know, truth is in that word Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. What does that make you think of? Calling him the beginning of God's creation. So John 1, right? Yeah. yeah. He's the creator. Yeah, yeah, that Jesus is a part of the creation, the spoken word that by whom all things were made. Yeah, beautiful stuff. We don't always think about it. Yeah, well, Pastor, what you shared there uh, about sharing Christ's throne, it made me think in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, talks about our sinful condition, and then it says that God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive mm. together with Christ. Yeah. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us yeah. with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Seated us with him, yeah. with the Lord Jesus. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And the beauty with um, him being the beginning of God's creation is not only is he the beginning of the original creation, but also the beginning of the new creation. You know, he is the first fruits, right? That we hear him call him. So that's who he is. Who are, who are the church there? They're lukewarm. So he'll spit them out. And I actually kind of like that because I think there's a, there's a paralyzing fear that can happen with you know, are we too bold? Are we too, and I, it, sometimes it's easy to do nothing. And that's what I kind of think of with this lukewarm. You know, think of Peter. Who is Peter but fiery? And so on the one hand, yeah, he says some things and then Jesus rebukes him. But then he's also the one that's fiery and ready to witness to others. So, you know, he's, he's not afraid to be warm. You know, 
And then I think of cold, you know, perhaps someone that's just more subdued in their faith, but also is ready um, to step up and encourage. And I, I think of this lukewarm thing, just being afraid to do anything. That's what I think of. And that's... Person that's sitting on the fence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. You know, you just, you don't know what to do, so you don't do anything so that yeah. you don't want to screw up. And that's not the Christian faith. We have confidence and, and hope and trust in our Lord so that we can, we can act, we can do things. You know, say it. Oh, I don't have an opinion. Yeah. If this wants to do that and they want to do that, well, that's yeah. their business. It's not my concern. Yeah, yeah. It always drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. I have an opinion one way or the other. <laughs> Some <laughs> decisiveness. On the fence, right? Like, if you're on the fence, I want to force my opinion on you. Yeah. I feel like we'd be kind of guilty of that. Well, and that's true. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I, there, there's certainly that aspect that we want to encourage people. Uh, and I... I, I think about that a lot. How can we bring people that are on the kind of the cusp of faith and they're going to go one way or the other based on what they receive, you know, from people um, potentially. And so absolutely. Um, Dave, yeah. Well, you know, from what he says in the next verse, it almost sounds like an arrogance holding the position that I really don't need anything. Yeah. I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I have needed nothing, not realizing that you are wretched and pitiable, poor and blind and naked. There's just a real blindness there to spiritual <laughs> need. It almost that almost sounds like the the reputation that was talked about earlier. You know that maybe they're they're Christian in name, but in reality they they're fine. They don't need they don't need what this church is about. You're right. There is sort of an arrogance there. Yeah. Well, it was like the rich man who had all this grain and everything. Yeah, he yep. Didn't have a way to store it. Yeah, so he yeah. Tore down his it's buildings and was going to make more. It's all his and stuff. He died that He's night. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, didn't we? <laughs> and just and, and really, that's the perfect one because you know what was you know make yourself rich towards God, and then that's what he says. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. White gar the white garments keep coming up, and they're going to keep coming up, people. Yeah. And that's what's beautiful here. The white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your make nakedness may not be seen. Isn't that cool how much it keeps, you know, Dean, you brought it up already, but the connection's back to Genesis. You know, the nakedness of Adam and Eve. I mean, it's beautiful. What a wonderful conclusion that we receive in this revelation. Uh, it connects us right back to the beginning. And then, so, verse oh, 20, yeah. you know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm -hmm. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Well, that's that saying that we don't seek him. He seeks us. Right. He's coming to the door. And, and it's just, just he's, he's looking for an answer. Because, you, I, I, you know, it's, I feel like this verse does kind of get used as a guilt trip sometimes. You know, are you going to answer? Whereas, it's more like encouraging, hey, you know, Listen. And an answer. I mean, how can we not answer? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, kind of like those altar calls. Well, right. It can kind of be a little, uh, uh, yeah, guilt tripping. What's the other word I'm thinking of? They, they think we're the ones that are going to seek. Yeah, well, we're, right. Yeah, the emphasis kind of gets come put come on ourselves. And, and, and that, there's always the balance. You know, obviously we need to respond. We've established that. But we recognize, no, he is the door. He has done everything. Mm -hmm. The focus should be on him. And really, how do you get people to want that? You don't say, you need to want it. No, no, talk about how great this is. Yes. Give them reason right. to want to answer the door, right? Make sure that it's clear to them. Make sure they hear the gospel, as we talked about earlier. Uh, Dave, were you going to add something there? Uh, just, you know, I... I as Diane was alluding to, it, 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 this is often uh, shared with unbelievers yeah. in, in receiving Christ. Yeah. But this is addressed to a church. Yeah, isn't believers. it? That's kind of funny, isn't it? And, you know, so our hearts, again, getting back to the, the heart is right. the whole issue. Right. Having a right heart yeah. before God and, and walking with the Lord. You know, we can sidestepping yeah and not walk with him yeah
used to be, it seemed like every church you went in had the picture of Jesus standing well, at the door. Don't, did we have it up, or do we still have it up in the Sunday know. school somewhere? Okay, there's we have it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, you're right. It's yeah, like every, every church had that. Yeah, yeah. When I was growing up. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> verse 19. I I have this under life. I love this. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Very matter of fact. But really, I mean, what is this? This is the language of a parent. Disciplining a child. Reproving them. Holding them accountable. Wanting them uh, uh, to live rightly. Um, There's no question. He calls for action on our part. Mm -hmm. Be zealous. Repent. Mm -hmm. Be moved. Listen and, and, and understand how great this all is and how important it is. Um, Some of us maybe sometimes there's two voices. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. I carry my soapbox with me. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you and Peter, right? As long yeah. as it's done in love. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think it's to that, you know, call to be zealous and repent. Then he says, answer the door. I think this is definitely speaking to lukewarm Christians in that sense. Those sort of a name, but are really quite content apart from Christ. No. Um, listen. Be moved. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, again, aspects to those specific churches, no doubt. But very much, um, it may not be hard for each one of us as individuals to read through this and kind of see maybe... Maybe even where do we tend to fall in our in our own failures and and but to, but to hear that you know it's wonderful in that way because he says here's the problem here's the answer and here's why it matters here's the hope that you should have so it wonderful wonderful practical theology for us from our Lord and we learn about him learn about who he is so I think we'll wrap it up here for the day any. Uh, I don't even know where I'm going with this stuff. But where are these seven churches today? None of them are Christian, right? They're all it's, it, well, it's all in Turkey, so it's yeah, sure, not there. I don't yeah, know. there might be some uh, sort of underground. Uh, yeah, but that's but right. But isn't that the church? Isn't that the history of the church? It's always moving. It goes out from Jerusalem. It goes. Um, you know, Turkey was a very Christian area then. Kind of moves west and it just kind of keeps, you know, it's going from America to Africa. That's where it's going right now. That's where there's a lot of Christians. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the joke. In 50 years, Africa will be sending missionaries to America, not the they're other way around. Well, they, there, there's always some of that, right? Yeah. It's, the church is always moving. So, uh, and and I think I think for the very reason that when people get too comfortable with it as just being a societal norm, it never goes well. You know, you had it legal, like we already mentioned, you know, con, you know, with Constantine making it the legal religion. All right, the kingdom's here. Well, no, what happens? It falls apart and it moves. Um, there's, always the there's always a faithful remnant and they always, it passes on. It goes to all people, all nations, all languages. It just keeps moving. We should be praying that we are part of the faithful remnant. Yeah. The way our world is going. I want to stay that. God's will is done. We pray it would be done in our lives as well. We'd like to be a part of that goodwill. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I just, you know, in the Lord's counsel to the church there at Laodicea, one of the things he says, I staff to anoint your eyes. And, you know, I, I thought about these different pieces that the Lord has shared with them. And I said, you know, that makes me think of the Word of God. Mm. The only thing that's going to sort open, of open our spiritual eyes, eyes yeah. is <laughs> Excuse the me. Word of God. And it's just counsel from the Lord to yeah. get into the Word of God. No doubt. Yeah, Bruce. Just another response to what Mike was asking. Um, I can't remember the name of the author, but there's a, a, a fellow that's written a book, and I think he's even got a documentary out that uh, at the time was scary, talking about the persecution mm -hmm. of um, Christians in uh, um well, even in Turkey, like if you if you wear, wear a cross and it, it becomes visible, you're fired. And, yeah. I mean, and, and it's worse. Yeah. I mean, it can yeah. be much worse. And your houses are burned and things like that. It just, uh, it's, it would be hard to, be, you have to really be underground to be a Christian in, in 
places like Turkey. Yeah. Because the Muslim faith does not tolerate it. Yeah. Because everybody is born a Muslim, unless you're a Jew. Right. And if you're a Jew, they need to kill them anyway, right? right? And if you're not a Muslim and you're not a Jew, then you're yeah. a Muslim. And right. if you're not, if you're a Christian, right. then you're a heretic. Right. And that's just how they view you. Yeah. Hmm. Well, also, it's not necessarily that, you know, the church just waned away. There was a, there, you know, you had the Armenian Genocide. A lot of things that happened. Well, sure. There, yeah, the persecution oh, yeah. happens. Really yeah. Yeah. Out, yeah. You know, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. You know, you know, Satan throws his, his forces at the church, um, but it, it remains. Um, I was going to say something. I forgot it now. Oh, well. No, the church remains, and it's it's present all around the world. Some, I, I was going to say, you, you think of the verse, um, they need to be uh, uh, innocent as doves, but crafty as serpents. That's how those Christians have to live. You know, you're faithful, but it doesn't do a lot of good to stick your neck out when you don't need to. You know, there's, there's a time for uh, taking persecution on the chin, but there's also a time to be wise. And, and so, you know, Christians have dealt with that all around the world, different times and different places. I count ourselves blessed that, you know, we do not deal with that severe of persecution, but in different kinds, certainly. So um, the, the church will remain, and our Lord is coming. Let's close with the Lord's yeah. Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.